So we have the pleasure of having with us uh, Katie Burroughs. Uh, Katie got a postdoc fellowship at the European Space Agency, and she used using synthetic Apache radar. And today she will be sharing her results on resolving the impacts of earthquakes, storms, and prolonged rainfall on shallow landsliding using Sentinel-1 synthetic Aperture data, radar data. Thank you. Uh, when you're ready, Katie. Oh, uh, thank you, Anne and uh, thank you everyone for coming to see my talk. Uh, yes, so as she says, I work at the Space Agency, so this will be work that I've done there in the Science Hub, and also work I did in my previous postdoc in uh, JET, Toulouse. Um, I list some of my co-author um, collaborators that have worked with me um, on the work I will present today. Um, and as you can guess from the fact that I work at the Space Agency, this talk is going to be very heavy on remote sensing and extremely light on field work. So I hope that that's fine for everyone. Um, how do I change slide? Ah, okay, so uh, shallow landslides. So when we talk about shallow landslides, we're talking about um, rapid failures occurring in the top few meters of soil. And earthquakes and rainfall, like storms, can trigger shallow landslides across very wide areas. And this is a major source of erosion in mountain landscapes. And it also poses a significant hazard to the communities that live in these areas. And we use multispectral satellite images to sense these landslides from space. And an example of that is shown on the right hand side here. So these are multispectral images taken before and after an earthquake in Indonesia. So these are false color composites where the red parts of the image are the most green in real life, so there's a forest. And you can see in the lower image that there are some landslides which have removed the vegetation compared to the top image. And so all we have to do is draw polygons around these in QGIS, or you can do this automatically with various algorithms, and you can compile inventories of the landslides that have been triggered by, in this case, an earthquake. And we can use these inventories to do things like assess the impact of an event on the landscape, um, to build physical and empirical models of the landsliding process and to calibrate these models, uh, to inform risk reduction strategies in these types of environments, and also to estimate the volume of sediments that are being produced by these earthquakes and storms and things like that. And just to give you a kind of example of the kind of things we can do if we have a lot of inventories from a lot of different events, this is um, an example of trying to predict the total volume of landslides based on a um, the size of an earthquake. There have also been more recent examples um, in the bottom left. This is a global collection of rainfall triggered landslide inventories, so um, in landslides triggered by storms. And they've tried to, in this plot, assess how well slope can be used to predict landslide probability. Um, and then on the right, this is um, a more finished product. This is the USGS ground failure prediction model, where essentially they try to predict how many landslides have been triggered immediately after an earthquake for emergency response, or how many landslides would be triggered by hypothetical earthquakes for planning. And in all of these cases, what they're doing is they're taking a large number of inventories of past landslides and seeing what the triggering conditions were that caused them. So how much was the ground shaking? How steep were the slopes where the landslides happened? What lithology um, or what impact did lithology have on this? And all these types of studies are very useful in helping us understand the impacts of storms and earthquakes on the landscape. Um, but all of them are designed based on the idea inventories where all the landslides can be associated with a single trigger. So one big earthquake, for example, that triggers a lot of landslides. So what happens if instead of that, we have multiple triggers occurring in succession? For example, a storm followed by, a land, followed by an earthquake or a sequence of several earthquakes. If we want to better understand how landsliding evolves during these sequences, then we need information on the landslide timing. And at this point, we run into a problem with the multispectral satellite images that I used before. So in fact, the example I showed you before and after this earthquake, and this was actually not one earthquake, it was a sequence of four earthquakes. And although we have good cloud-free imagery um, halfway through the sequence, so after the second earthquake, and at the end of the sequence, you can see that between image earthquakes one and two, and between earthquakes three and four, there's a lot of cloud cover 
So essentially, we can't tell when during the sequence a lot of the landslides happened. Um, and this is a problem in what light, ah, in wide areas in the world. So in this map, um, the red pixels show the areas which are most at risk of landsliding, of earthquake triggered landslides, sorry. Um, and the areas that are not grayed out are areas where we're likely to have at least three days of cloud cover for certain months of the year. So you can see that there are a lot of areas, particularly in Southeast Asia and the Central Americas, where we have large populations at risk of earthquake triggered landslides. And we also have long periods of cloud cover that obscure this multispectral satellite imagery. And obviously this is for earthquake triggered landslides. But as you can imagine, since um, the rain that triggers rainfall triggered landslides is coming from clouds, it's almost even more of a problem when we're looking at storms or monsoon rainfall. So today I will show you four examples, all taken from these um, very cloudy red areas of the map. Um, so an earthquake in Haiti, an earthquake in Nepal, one in the Philippines, and one in Indonesia. Um, and if you look first in the bottom right hand of the screen, this is the example I showed you at the beginning where we have four earthquakes occurring in a row and there was a lot of cloud cover between the first and second earthquake and the third and fourth earthquake. So in this case, we can only associate the landslides to the first half or the second half of the sequence. We can't know exactly when they happened. We have something similar happening in the example on the left, which is an earthquake sequence in the Philippines. In this case, we have some areas where you can distinguish between the first, the second and third, or the fourth earthquake, and some areas where you can only distinguish between either the first three or the fourth. Um, and in the top right, we have the example of a magnitude 7.2 earthquake that occurred in Haiti in 2021 and was followed a few days later by a tropical storm. And in this case, only 10% of the affected area could be mapped between the two events. So the inventory essentially doesn't really contain any information on which landslides were triggered by the earthquake and which ones were triggered by the hurricane. And the solution to this, or the solution that I work on in particular, is to use Sentinel-1. So Sentinel-1 can acquire images in all weather, so it can penetrate cloud. Um, we have global acquisitions every 6 to 12 days since 2015, although um, the six-day period is only really from 2017 up till 2021. But we're hoping to get back to six days soon when Sentinel-1C is launched. Um, the satellite works by actively illuminating the Earth's surface, as is shown in this um, image on the right. And so it actively illuminates the Earth's surface and it records the amplitude and phase of the signal that's returned. And it's very sensitive to changes at the Earth's surface. The wavelength is around 5.5 centimeters, just to give you an idea of the sort of um, size of a change that has to be before we can detect it. And the resolution of this data is 20 by 22 meters. So maybe if you have um, if you know a bit about Sentinel-1 already, you might be used to seeing it more in this form, which is where you use the phase or the difference in phase between two images acquired over the same area at different times to map the deformation. So in this case, this is the deformation due to an earthquake. Um, and this is a really useful tool, but for the kind of landslides that we're looking at, they actually move too fast to be detected in this way. So instead, we're going to use um, the amplitude and the coherence to study the landslides. Um, and we can start with the amplitude, which... So, okay, so here's an example of an amplitude image over the same area. And you can see that this is great. There are no cloud images anywhere. Um, you can see some of the topography. You can see this volcanic cone in the center. Um, there is this dark part in the middle, that's a lake. But this image was acquired um, immediately after the earthquake. And if I asked you to look at it and tell me where the landslides are, you really can't do that because the landslide signal is quite complicated. It's not the same between different landslides. And it also, the images can be quite distorted. So um, we're going to do a two-step process where we first map the landslide locations using multispectral satellite imagery, as I showed you at the beginning of the talk, because we know that works. Um, and then we're going to analyze SAR data through time for every landslide polygon. Um, 
And there are several ways in which landslides change the scattering properties of the Earth's surface, which is what gives them um, a signal in the SAR amplitude time series. So in general, we're looking at landslides that are occurring in a forest. So the main change is that we've gone from a forest canopy to a surface of, made up of bare rock and broken up material. Um, and this that first change is what causes this first thing on the list. So that's the change in mean amplitude between the landslide polygon and the, um, the area around it. The second thing is that the landslide pixels become more variable. So um, all this broken up material, you have big boulders and small boulders and broken up tree trunks and things. And this is much more variable than the canopy, which is what Sentinel-1 would be seeing outside of the landslide. And then we have two more effects which are caused by the oblique viewing angle of the satellite. So if you look in the bottom right on the screen, the satellite takes the images at an angle. And because of this, you get shadows cast at the edge of landslide polygons by the trees. And you also get this double bounce effect on the opposite side, which is caused by scattering off the tree trunks. Um, and when we test this on landslides whose timing we already know, so ones that are either triggered by one big earthquake or by a single short period of rainfall, we can see in the examples on the right that you get a permanent step change in each thing that can be used to give you the landslide timing. Um, however, not every landslide has every has a good signal in every uh, method. So we use all four methods together. And what we found is that we were able to time 30% of the landslides in an inventory with an 80% accuracy, or around up to 10% with a 90% accuracy if we're a bit stricter about what we allow. So if we go back now to our inventories of landslides that lack um, timing information and we apply the amplitude methods, we can constrain some of the landslides in time. So there are some limitations to this. The first one is that if you look at the Philippines earthquake, we didn't have any SAR imagery between the second and third earthquake, so we couldn't resolve those. Um, and the other one is that we have not been able to get timing information for all of the landslides. So as I said before, you can only get around a third of them. So all the untimed landslides are plotted with these little gray triangles. But overall, you can see that um, we've got a pretty good spread of timed landslides across all the different case studies. And so we can start to better understand how the landsliding is evolving through time. And now I will show you the a more specific example in more detail, which is the um, earthquake sequence in Lombok, Indonesia. So um, this is the same event. I'm sorry, I changed the color scale for some reason. Um, but you can see in the time series, as I said before, we have four earthquakes. They're mapped halfway through the sequence. At this point, there were 4,800 landslides. By the end of the sequence, there were 9,300. These are all, this is all based on an inventory map by Francesca Ferrario. And of these 9,000, 991 are big enough for us to expect to time them with the land, with the amplitude methods. So sorry, I didn't, I forgot to mention that before, but the amplitude methods can only be applied to reasonably medium or large size landslides. And so if we apply those methods, we can time 307 of the landslides with SAR, and we can then go back and check them against some optical satellite imagery. So by using as much optical imagery as we can possibly get, we were able to check 190 of the 307 landslides and 92% of these were correct. So it looks like these methods are working pretty well in this location. And so from this, we can move forward to think about the triggering conditions. So the, there was all these are all earthquake triggered landslides. So they were triggered by the shaking during this earthquake sequence. So we can look at the peak ground acceleration, um, which is available from the USGS shake map website. And you can see that the earthquake on the 5th of August is by far the one with the strongest shaking. And 73% of the landslides that we found were triggered during this earthquake. And we have relatively little landsliding triggered during the others. However, these other landslides are quite interesting for reasons that I will show you now. So as I said before, all the landslides on the 5th of August were triggered at relatively high peak ground accelerations. So you can ignore those on these graphs. But here we're plotting the peak ground acceleration on the x-axis against the area on the y-axis. 
And there are two black lines here which represent the minimum shaking that is expected to trigger landslides based off global sets of landslide inventories. So basically in these studies, they've looked at a lot of earthquake triggered landslides and got an idea of the minimum shaking that's required to trigger them. And you can see that we actually have quite a lot of landslides occurring on the wrong side of these lines. So on the left-hand side where the shaking should not really have been strong enough to cause anything. Um, and in particular, if you compare this bottom graph shows the frequency through the study area. So you can see that the first, third and fourth earthquake have relatively similar distributions of shaking through the study area. And yet it's only really in the third and fourth earthquakes where we see a lot of landslides on the wrong side of the line. And probably, or potentially, that's because the... Um, so it looks as though towards the end of the sequence, we're having landslides triggered at low peak ground acceleration values. Um, and this is quite interesting, and maybe it's because these are landslides that almost failed during second earthquake, or maybe it's because these landslides are undergoing multi-stage failure that we can then map in a different way. So currently, the area I've plotted on the left-hand side, as I said before, these landslides were mapped twice um, by Francesca Ferrario, halfway through the earthquake sequence and at the end. So I've plotted the area that they had on the 8th of August for the first two earthquakes, and then the area at the end of the sequence. If instead we draw a line between the um, area halfway through the sequence and the area at the end for all these polygons, you can see we actually have a lot of landslides that have increased in size during the sequence. So how can we better investigate this evolution of landsliding, or rather the individual landslides evolution? So that brings us now to the coherence of INSAR. So we're going back to this interferogram image I showed you before, which is the difference between two SAR images that are acquired over the same area at different times. The INSAR coherence is an estimate of the signal quality of every pixel in this image, and it's estimated by thinking about how similar the pixels are within a moving window of three by three. So I've highlighted on the map an area of high coherence and an area of low coherence. And you can see that, for example, in the high coherence area, if you took a three by three window of the pixels and you zoomed in a long way, you would probably get a box where you had three by three dark blue pixels all next to each other. Whereas if you did this in the low coherence area, all the colors are mixed together and that's because the um, interferogram has lost coherence. And in general, the things that cause this loss of coherence can be the physical movement of objects, the changes in soil moisture, and changes to the satellite acquisition geometry. And if you think about this first one, this is directly relevant to landslides. So interferograms that are formed from an image pair where one is before the landslide and one after are likely to lose coherence within the landslide polygon because, um, because of the amount of stuff that has moved around within the landslide. Um, another thing to think about, though, is that if you take an interferogram formed from two images acquired after the landslide, it will probably have a high coherence because now we're looking at a, a surface that is just bare rock and soil. We've removed all the vegetation, and the vegetation will move around quite a lot, like the leaves will change orientation or move and this will also cause low coherence. So we can use um, coherence time series to time landslides, as we were doing with the amplitude. So in this example, um, I've taken the first SAR image in the time series, image zero, and calculated the interferogram with that image and every other image possible. And we can divide this time series up into three parts. So the first one on the left is the maximum coherence where we're taking the interferogram is formed with image zero and image zero. So these are two, they're perfectly correlated because it's the same image used twice. So we can ignore that, it's not very interesting. Then on the far right, we have the co-event portion where we're taking um, an image before the earthquake, no, yes, earthquake, um, which is image zero, and doing it with, for example, image 10, this will give a low coherence because the landslide has happened between the two images. 
And then we have the pre-event part where both images are acquired before the landslide happened. However, because of the amount of movement of vegetation, these areas are also still quite incoherent. Um, oh, and I should have said, sorry, that the landslide in this time series occurs between image eight and nine. That's what's shown by the red star. So instead of doing that, we could take the last image in the time series and go the other way. And in this case, we still have this co-event part, which is um, quite low coherence, but we also now have a post-event section, which has a high coherence um, because it is now imaging bare rock rather than vegetation. And the natural next step to that is to calculate every single possible combination of coherences or combination of images to calculate a whole coherence matrix for this landslide. And then we can, take the four possible earthquakes, so the four possible landslide timings, and see how what would happen if we divided each, if we used each one to divide this um, plot into three parts. And you can see that the second earthquake is clearly the one that divides this landslide, sorry, that divides the matrix up best. So that's the timing of the landslide. And this is quite cool. So the same example is shown on the left-hand side here, but what's even better is that actually, if we have, we have several, landslides we've seen, where you actually clearly have several periods of failure, which implies that the we're actually detecting multi-stage failure. So the INSER coherence can detect multi-stage failure. It also appears to better indicate when the landslide first became active. So while the amplitude is detecting the point at which the most vegetation was removed, so the point where the whole thing fell down, um, coherence can is more sensitive and it can detect smaller things. So if we go back to the plot I showed you before of all our um, amplitude derived landslide timings, and I instead plot the coherence derived first failures, um, you can see that we've got far fewer data points because the coherence methods cannot be applied to as many landslides as amplitude, unfortunately, but we've got rid of all these landslides that were occurring on the wrong side of this line during the third uh, and fourth earthquake. Um, and we also have a lot more landslides that have been triggered during earthquake one. So if you look here, we had maybe eight, and here we clearly have a lot more than eight. If we then plot all the reactivations we can see, then you can see that we've put back all the landslide activity that was occurring at very low peak ground accelerations. So, oops, so it appears that um, the so we can start to better understand how the hazard progresses or how the minimum peak ground acceleration required for landslide activity changes during the earthquake sequence. Um, and another way we can look at this is to plot them all on the map. So these are all the landslides that were triggered during the first earthquake. Or no, they're all the landslides that can be mapped that can be timed with coherence that were triggered during the first earthquake. Then during the second earthquake, we get some more landslides and we also reactivate some of the original ones. During the third earthquake, we don't get any new ones, but we reactivate quite a lot of landslides that, already, that have already failed. And during the fourth earthquake, the fourth set of earthquakes, sorry, because this is actually three that occurred within a few hours, we um, get some more new landslides and we also reactivate some of the old ones. So overall, we've been able to use amplitude and coherence to assess how landsliding evolved during this earthquake sequence. We can see a lot of landslides undergoing multi-stage failure, and we can see that relatively low peak ground accelerations can still trigger landslide activity late in the sequence. There are some specific limitations to the method, so we can only look at medium-large landslides. Uh, the amplitude methods work best in forested areas, while the coherence appears to work better in less forested areas because the how low the coherence can be during over the forest. Um, uh, we also, so quite a lot of the landslides don't have any signal. We're not timing all of them. We just get a sort of sample across the study area. And another thing that I didn't mention is that coherence is susceptible to changes in soil moisture, which is an example shown here. So part of the reason we need this full matrix is that if you have a rainfall event, and this represents a temporary coherence loss that you can see in the bottom here. Um, so while it's worked really well for the Lombok 
earthquake sequence, it would potentially not work at all if we tried to apply this in Haiti, where we have an earthquake followed by a hurricane, because you would see the coherence loss due to rainfall and you wouldn't be able to differentiate between that and um, a landslide reactivation. So to move on, I thought I would quickly also present another case study um, in Nepal. So this is a somewhat more difficult case study because firstly, we're looking at monsoon triggered landslides. So we have no prior knowledge on when they happened at all. Um, we can't assume they have occurred at the same time as the earthquake as we could in the previous example. And also um, because it's rainfall triggered, we can't really use the coherence methods. We can only use amplitude. Um, so in Nepal, heavy rainfall triggers thousands of landslides every year between May and October. And there are several factors that influence the total amount of landslides. So in the bottom of this graph, you can see the first one, which is the total amount of rainfall. So you can see that in a normal year, the total volume of landslides, which is what's shown on the y-axis, is controlled by the total amount of rainfall. So this is um, from a paper by Jones et al. However, in um, certain years where we've had short, intense storms, they saw much higher um, mass wasting than you would expect from the total rainfall. And also following the 2015 earthquake, you can see um, an increased sediment, an increased amount of landsliding. So overall, we can see that there are three factors we have to consider if we want to look at landslides in Nepal. And if we want to start untangling the different effects of these three factors, we need the landslide timing information again. So we can apply the Sentinel-1 methods to the inventories mapped by Jones et al. And for four years, 2015, 2017, 2018, and 2019, um, unfortunately, there was not enough Sentinel-1 data in 2016, so this year had to be skipped. Um, and these are all plotted in a map on the left. You can see we have quite a good spread across the whole study area. If we look at the distribution of them through time on the right, you can see that we had a really big peak in landsliding in 2017. So a lot of landslides that year occurred at the same time. We see the same thing to a lesser extent in 2019 in July. And finally, in 2015, you can see a kind of swell of early landsliding, where the, or the landsliding started much earlier than in a normal year. Um, so the first thing to look at is these two peaks. So these peaks in time are actually spatiotemporal clusters of landslides, and we can link them to periods of intense localized rainfall that have either been detected in rain gauges, reported in the media, or um, measured during, from satellite rainfall products. Um, in particular, in 2017, 40% of the landslides we timed were triggered by three days of heavy rainfall in the Terai region. So that's shown in the pink circle in the bottom right, and it's in the south of Nepal. Um, we saw something similar in 2019, although the landslide clusters are much more dispersed in this case. And finally, in 2018, um, we found what looked like a tight spatial cluster of landslides that could have been tied to the some heavy rainfall on the 13th of September. But in fact, with our spatial analysis, we can split this into two spatiotemporal clusters, one which occurred in the middle of August and is believed to have been triggered by snowmelt, um, and then the other which was associated with this heavy rainfall event. So overall, we can see that there is quite a strong impact of storms within the overall monsoon rainfall. So if the next thing we want to look at is the effects of um, prolonged rainfall and the effects of earthquakes. And we can model the amount of rainfall that was required to trigger the landslide using a leaky bucket model. So this is a way of modeling how much water was in the soil at the point when the landslide failed. So we're modeling the soil as a bucket with a hole in it. Um, and when you have enough water in your bucket, which is caused by rain going in with a small amount of it evaporating back out, once you reach the hole in the bucket, you begin to have drainage. And this is known as the field capacity. So in general, we don't expect many landslides to be occurring below this field capacity. However, you can see that although this idea is pretty much obeyed in, for example, 2017 and 2019 and 2018, in 2015, we have quite a lot of landslides occurring below this line. 
And even if we um, cut out all the landslides right on the bottom of this, on the basis that they were, we've recorded them as occurring in almost dry conditions, which means that either they've been triggered by a land by a rainfall event that we haven't captured in the data we used. So we're using the GPM satellite rainfall product, sorry. So either that did not capture the rainfall event or the landslides were not triggered by rainfall. They were triggered by either the earthquake or progressive failure after an earthquake, or they were triggered maybe by road building, although we tried to remove all the landslides that were connected to roads from this data set. So overall, you can see even if we remove these, we still have quite a lot of landslides in 2015 occurring below the field capacity that need to be explained. Um, and generally, the failure should be controlled by the amount of water in the soil, how steep the slope is, and the internal friction and cohesion, which together represent the strength of the hill slope. So if we want landslides occurring in drier conditions in 2015, in the same in the same slope because they're occurring in the same mountain range, then we need to in some way weaken the hill slopes to account for this in a model. Um, and we can use the factor of safety equation to relate all these conditions together. And if we allow all of this weakening to be taken up by cohesion loss, we can start to estimate that you would need a loss of cohesion for the 2015 landslides of between one and three kilopascals to explain this um, drop in, ah, sorry, this increase in dry landsliding in 2015. So all of these landslides are rainfall triggered, not earthquake triggered, and yet we can still see the effect of the earthquake in the rainfall triggered landslides. Um, so in conclusion, Sentinel-1 amplitude and coherence are a new tool that allow us to better constrain when landslides are happening. And with this information, we can begin to untangle the combined effects of sequences of earthquakes and storms and long periods of rainfall. Um, I've shown you two case studies. The first one was in Indonesia, where we saw that as you got later in the sequence, you can have landslide activity caused by relatively little shaking. Um, we used INSAR coherence as well to reveal that many landslides appear to have undergone multiple stages of failure during this earthquake sequence. And in the second case of the Nepal Namonsoon, um, the Sentinel-1 landslide timing data revealed that earlier and drier landsliding following the 2015 Gorkha Nepal earthquake, which we can explain by a transient loss of hill slope strength. Um, and we also saw that individual storms triggering spatiotemporal clusters of landslides can also strongly affect the total landslides during um, a monsoon season. And for example, in 2017, 40% of the landslides could be associated with individual storms. Um, this is just a list of references. Um, I thought I would also quickly advertise the a journal, Geomorphica, in case you've not heard of it. So I'm on the communications team for this journal. It's a fully volunteer-led diamond open access geomorphology journal that has just recently launched last year. Um, and diamond open access means that you do not have to pay to publish or read in this journal. So we would love to have your submissions, or if you would like to volunteer, you can um, get in touch with the organizing team. And uh, thank you. I'll go back to the conclusions for the questions. Thank you, Katie, for this really interesting talk. Um, so if everyone uh, can like put their questions in the chat, we will um, read them out to Katie. Um, in the meantime, um, I have like some some basic question, I guess. Um, what is the link between the strength of the signal that you have like in your two methods and um, some parameters that you could find in the field? Why would you get like a uh, strong signals uh, for some landslides and less stronger for some else? Um, so the SAR is very strongly dependent on orientation. So the, the satellite moves north-south and takes images from the east and from the west. So the, the way that the slope faces is very important. So landslides that are facing towards the sensor or away from the sensor can be better or worse sensed by the um, system. Um, also, I have a what's my I have an example here where you have a so there's a very small failure that you can see in this first image. 
and then a much bigger failure later. So this is after the first earthquake and after the second earthquake. And you can see both failures appear somewhat equal in the coherence. So this is almost, oops, oversensitive. Um, but the amplitude method would only detect the second failure, which is detect which is the one that's caused the biggest change. So it depends a bit for the methods and what exactly you're detecting as well. Okay, thank you. And we start to have some questions. So we have a, like a question from Holly Baziuk. A really neat study. You mentioned that this works best for med large landslides. What approximate size do you mean in uh, square meters and how tight are your detection intervals? So the the amplitude data comes in 20 by 22 meter resolution. When we look at the coherence, we're using a three by three window. So that goes up to 60 by 66 meters. So generally we, we require multiple pixels within the landslide polygon to do the amplitude analysis to calculate the statistics and things like that. So we we tend to limit the amplitude analysis to landslides that are at least 2000 meters squared and the coherence analysis, we limit it to landslides that are 3600 meters squared. So the size of the coherence window. In general, they work better and better for bigger landslides and worse and worse for smaller ones. So you just have to draw this threshold somewhere. Okay, nice. Uh, then I continue. Uh, we also have a question from Akshay Rajmun Manocha. Sorry for the pronunciation. Hey, um, which insert technique was used for building time series of landslides? And is INSAR effect affected for landslides that are less than one kilometer? And he started with a third question that is not written yet. So I guess the first question is like, which insert technique was used for building the time series that you present? Is it like um, a combination? So most of the most of the time series was based on the amplitude time series. And then also in Indonesia, we were able to use the coherence as well because it's a fairly simple earthquake sequence in that it didn't have any rainfall during the sequence, which would have maybe changed the soil moisture and made the signal less reliable. And uh, I'm not sure I understand the second question. Is INSAR effect affected for landslides that are below one kilometer? But so I guess it was like the a same size. as the previous question. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. And then is PSI or is SBAS techniques useful? So these these are these techniques are very useful, but the landslides that I'm looking at are moving too fast to do this. So generally, if you want to use PSI or SBAS, you have to look at a landslide that is moving less than, I think it's a quarter of the wavelength. So in this case, like one and a half centimeters in between the two image acquisitions. And during an earthquake or a storm, all these shallow landslides, they occur much too fast. So these techniques are generally used more for deep seated ground deformations and shallow landslides. Thanks. Uh, Trent is asking um, which geometric distortions being somewhat unavailable depending on slope orientation, is it better to use image pairs focused on slopes facing towards the sensor or away? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. So the there are advantages and disadvantages to the different ones. If we go back to the, uh, where's the amplitude method here? Um, so in this image, the bottom image here is flat and we have shadows and double bounce mechanisms. If you imagine the entire thing was tilted towards the sensor, you would probably lose the shadows in the polygon, but you might get more double bounce. If it's facing away, you would get bigger shadows, which would make it easier to detect. Um, the coherence methods are sensitive in a different way because the it's sensitive to the... If the satellite is not in exactly the same place, you get a decorrelation, which is stronger on steep slopes that face towards the sensor. So in general, the 
The question is, it depends. You just have to choose the method that suits the slope best. But between the, all the sensors and all the methods, we have a reasonably good spread across slopes facing in any direction. Uh, thank you. And um, the second part of the question, is it is it better to have shadow layover or foreshortening impacting an image there? Um, so actually in this, in the example of the Lombok earthquake, there are not there is not a huge amount of foreshortening and layover because of this is dependent on how steep the slope is. But in general, I think if we have areas of foreshortening and layover, which we did in Nepal, you just have to mask these out because there's no way to recover this information. The it's essentially areas that are not being imaged by the SAR sensor. Oh, okay. And then um, maybe yeah, the way, uh, oh. Yeah, 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 sorry. So my, yeah, so there's a question from audience. Great talk, Katie, very nice to see the new coherence method. So the first one is, could you detail why coherence works for less landslides? Do you need to apply it on larger landslides or it just variability of something else? Yeah, there are two other questions. Maybe we can address one by one. Oh, yeah, OK, so the first question. Um, so yes, coherence needs larger landslides because you're using you have we have to use a three by three window to calculate the coherence, which tends to blur out all the smaller landslides. So automatically you have to um, throw away a lot of small landslides when you're using coherence. Um, also, in general, the method is quite sensitive to um, as I mentioned before, if the satellite's not in exactly the same place and things like this. So it can also cause problems. Um, but in general, if I, oh, where's my, so if the main problem is that here, I'm looking at an area that's um, that's essentially covered in tropical rainforest. And the landslides that we mostly time best with coherence are in these less vegetated areas around the cone. So part of it is that coherence works best, particularly in Sentinel-1, um, in less vegetated areas. But generally, landslide inventories are easier to collect in heavily vegetated areas. So there's, it's partly also a mismatch between what you can map in optical satellite imagery and what you can detect with the SAR. Yeah, good point. Okay, so the second one is this is also more computer computation computationally expensive as you need to produce a pair of interferograms. Correct. Any info on processing time? Uh, yeah. So the mm, yeah. So it's true that amplitude methods. Um, so all the amplitude methods can be implemented in Google Earth Engine. So essentially the processing time is quite short. It's not too hard to do. Um, the coherence is, I agree, much more computationally expensive. And that's why it's almost, if you want to look, if you wanted to look at a, one particular landslide, it would be worth checking um, how well oriented it is towards the sensor and things like this before you start to know whether it's worth processing all the INCSAR coherence matrices because for some of them, you won't get a good result, and it is quite a lot more work than just doing the amplitude analysis. I see. OK, so the third one is, is it correct that after detecting reactivation in the coherence, you could retrieve, based on coherence, the size of each reactivation event, parentheses, by looking at individual pixel within the polygon representing all the successive failures? Um, so I found one example where it's possible to do that. So you can see like a small incoherent patch after one earthquake, but then spreads to be bigger after a subsequent earthquake. But in a lot of cases, it's um, not really possible. And when we're looking at the matrix, it's partly because we have to do a, like we're essentially taking as many interferings as possible to try and increase this signal to noise ratio because if you were just looking at the difference between the pre-event and co-event part 
and you only had a few images, you wouldn't really be able to see. So if you start then going to like smaller spatial scales where you're seeing smaller effects, it becomes, I don't know. I've seen a few examples where it works, but I don't think it's something you could do across the whole image very easily. Right. And then we have a question from uh, Abhishek Dixit. Um, hey, useful work. Seeking your suggestion, what is the best way to estimate the total sediment generated if we have to do this for hundreds of landslides? Um, that's very difficult to answer. So at the moment, the way that you usually estimate the sediment is using um, empirical formula where you're estimating the volume based on the size of the polygons in the optical satellite images. If we now are saying that, in fact, these polygons are reactivating several times and releasing more sediment into the system, then probably these empirical formula will not really be applicable anymore. But also, the coherence seems to essentially be saturated. So here we have it being very low in all earthquakes. But I don't know, because we don't have um, in this case, we don't really have field measurements. I don't know exactly how much material was lost in each one, so it's hard to know whether the whether the coherence is just drops to zero when you have a very small movement, and it also would drop to zero if you had a huge amount of depth of material moved. I don't know. I don't think at the moment it's possible to get a better idea of the sediments released from this. Okay, yeah, so we have another question from Kyra uh, asking, do you look at areas that have a similar coherence of amplitude signal that you would expect to see for landslides that are not mapped as, as landslides and maybe interpret those as landslide movements of is your analyst limited to landslide polygons from human trees compliant from non insa methods? So at the moment, this analysis is um, limited to um, that. However, there are also different types of studies where you can use the INSAR coherence drop um, after, for example, an earthquake or the change in amplitude after an earthquake. And you can use that to map areas that are have been heavily impacted by landslides. So these can be used to detect new failures but I'm not sure you can really do both at once at the moment. You have to choose one or another because generally those methods, at least with coherence, you're detecting more of a heat map of where landslides have happened rather than individual polygons. Interesting. I have I have a personal question. Um, when you when you looked at, for example, like the it was was it I don't remember where in two thousand. 25 you had uh, an earthquake and you had like those landslides getting triggered below this threshold value this field yes. um, um, I was wondering also during the year can you can you see that stuff like can you see like a trend during the year is it lasting for only one year or do you see some of it as well in uh, in the beginning of 2016 for example oh in 2015 no so um uh, if we go back to the graph so it looks as though in 2016, this effect was still visible because we still had more landslides than we would usually expect in 2016. Um, however, the Sentinel-1 satellite in 2016 did not acquire enough images over Nepal for us to get a time series that year. So all we can say is this effect was definitely visible in 2015 and it appears to have gone by 2017. Okay, I see. But yeah, unfortunately, we're missing quite a useful year in the time series. Okay, I see. Nice, thanks. So we don't have much, much more questions so far. I don't know if you have personal questions, you hate. No, I don't have. Maybe the audience, if I mean, if any of the audience have a question, you can raise. I mean, you can unmute yourself. And just asking. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. 
so you think we could like detect some kind of exha exhaustions of landslides, for example, after after an earthquake? I mean, you can already see it a bit, but um, because we can only detect the, the big landslides, right? So we cannot detect like the small landslides. Mm -hmm. And so you would you be able in a way to see like um, some kind of exhaustion effect after an earthquake or not? You mean, would you be able to see the point at which landslides stop being active after an yeah. earthquake? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Um, there's something that I would be interested in trying, but I don't know how easy it would be, particularly with the coherence. If you were looking at rainfall-triggered landslides, then you would have a soil moisture effect in the coherence matrix, which might make it quite complicated to see. Okay. Yes. Oh, oh we yeah, have we have a question from the audience. Audience, uh, could you just unmute yeah, yourself? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. hello, yeah. Thank you, uh, everyone, and thank you, thank you for organizing, uh, and thank you, Katy, for the talk. Uh, yeah, I, I have a similar maybe question on the um, or comment on the point about the um, minimum peak ground acceleration to to have the failure for the for the first example mm -hmm. you show where um, you show the lines that are maybe like zero one g or something like that and I think in in the two papers I mean for sure in in the paper I published but I think also in the one of Tanias and or and Lombardo. Um, these are a bit like statistical boundaries, so they, they, they say that you have more or less 95% of the landslide within this boundary, so they don't say that you have no landslide at lower shaking, but just that most of them is uh, below the shaking. So that's why it's a bit tricky to compare directly to the, to the line, because it's small numbers here. Uh, but maybe one interesting point is that you show after that most of these landslides near these lines are not new failures, but reactivation, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was what I uh, like. Go back and find the slide. Um, yeah, here. Yeah. Mm. Oh, no, that's not the right one. That's the... This one, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so my comment that that maybe there is an interesting question or topic that would be to try to make statistics of the condition of failure when you are looking at reactivation rather than than new failures and and if you can collect enough data maybe on this case or on other cases maybe it's interesting to compare original failure versus uh, reactivation. Um, oh yeah, but that's just to some... yeah. So the lines are not like strict rules it was just a to give an idea of where on this graph we're starting to reach the point where landsliding should be unlikely hmm. and especially with this these are still quite big landslides that are occurring at low peak ground accelerations That's reactivating rather hmm. yes thank you that's a good comment thanks <laughs> thank you for um, all the comments. I think uh, not so many more questions, so probably we can end the talk here. Thank you again, for Katie, for this great presentation, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for coming, everybody. Then, bye. Okay, bye. Bye.